What's up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Hypocritical AF Podcast. I am your host, Albert Fig. And in this week's special Zoom episode, I am joined by Katie Chonakis. What's up, Katie? Hey, what's up? Thanks so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. And I love the name of your <laughs> podcast. It's so Thank good. you. Thank you. Yeah. It, it's, I like to give myself a little bit of creativity over it, you know, the credit for it. But in the end, it's, you know, it's, it's, gonna, it's either going to stick or people are not going to like it. So I kind of just learned to go with it. It's so good. Like, I'm always like, not always, but a lot of times I'll be like, if I want to really make my point, I'll be like, AF, like, yes. and you know, I'm serious. It's In like, period. Too. Yeah. Caps, AF. <laughs> there you go. Exactly. Because we're bold people, right? Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm thankful. We're, like I said, we're able to set this up uh, via Zoom. And uh, you were saying right now, earlier before we saw, you know, got on air, you were saying you're in Michigan. I am. I'm, I'm here for a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. We got that time difference and everything. So Detroit. Thankfully, we have, thankfully, we have stuff like Zoom to do this, you know? I know. I know. Because if I was in LA right now, well, no, mm -hmm. even if I was in LA, we couldn't meet up in person. We couldn't meet up. Yeah. <laughs> so it'd be like, you know, but I also do mobiles. So I wouldn't say, you know, for sure, for sure. No, because I'd, yeah. I'd make a trip out there for sure. Oh, you're so sweet. That means a lot, actually. Yes. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Thank no, you. No, no, no problem. No problem. Okay, so um, I wanted to have you on and, and I reached out and uh, I wanted to set this up for multiple different reasons, but I'm very, very curious. You have so many different titles you can go by. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. If I could just, if it's okay with you, if I could just name a few and you can stop me, correct me anytime, but I mean, artist, voice artist, uh, voice actor, I'm sorry a poet, self-proclaimed, not proclaimed, but self-published author, painter, filmmaker, uh, producer, musician, and a podcast host yourself, the She's All Over the Place podcast. Yes, indeed. You got it. Am I missing any more? Uh, I just won a bunch of uh, certificates and awards for best director for okay. our new web series. It's a lockdown uh improv comedy series that I produced and directed uh, during the beginning of the pandemic. I just, I needed what I do. I just needed to put my head down. I'm like, what am I going to do? Create. It's all I know. So I just, I just create and I just mm -hmm. put it out there. So um, yeah, we went, we, I, then I shifted after putting out all this energy and um, we did season one, two, and three season one and two are on the sophisticated psychos YouTube channel. Yep. And I'm like, yo, I put out all this energy, like, what do I do now? So I put it on the train tracks to the film festival circuit and we entered into about over 50 film festivals and we've won six so far and it keeps, they keep coming every day. And we have over uh, 16 official selections and I won awesome. best director. Yeah. And producer on let the me, project so far. Let me give you some class for that one second. Hold on. Did you guys hear all that? Did you hear all that? Give, I got to give you your flowers while you're here. Jesus. Congrats on that. That's so much achievement. Um, we love to hear it over here. And um, yeah, creative is, I guess, the one title that I forgot to say too. Because initially, that's what you are. I mean, it, being able to create so much content and put so much stuff out, it takes a lot. And um, I always, myself over here, we always um, give the flowers for that and talk about the consistency. So if there's something that's, you know, the epitome of consistency, that's, I mean, you're exactly it. Thank you. Thank you. And I feel we all have it within us. Like when we're born, we're human beings, not human doers, like a to-do list. We're human beings. Mm -hmm. So when we're being, we get to that space of the unknown and that, that, that sweet spot of that space where you feel euphoric and nirvana and mm -hmm. you're not in your mind and you're dismantling judgments and, you know, all the emotions of guilt. And you're just, you get to a space of just you know, the unknown of creativity. And I feel like, you know, as human beings, we can just create. And that's the purpose, I feel, why we're here. For example, like, um, I always reference like Britney Spears and, and Taylor Swift because I love mm -hmm. them. Yeah. And there's been, you know, when I was a teenager and it was like, you know, show me the sign, her very first song. I'm like, I see all the signs. I see all the signs. Yeah. And then being able to witness her journey along the way and all the stuff that's coming out now. I mean, I'm very passionate about and I'm an advocate for because we've all like, you know, her and her, you know, all her fans and stuff mm -hmm. and we all have families and a lot of people have silently suffered and she has silently suffered and like her purpose is so much greater than than it's going to unfold beautifully i'm really uh, excited to be an advocate and be a part of you know who she is and what she's doing but um 
you know, like there's the macro influencers like Britney Spears and Taylor mm -hmm. Swift. And then there's micro influencers. And I was told through the SAG, through the union, that micro influencers actually have more impact than macro influencers because like a macro, they're getting one area, but like a micro, I can pick up anywhere in South Africa, Italy, like you mm. name like anywhere. I, and I like know someone who's the 1% of the 1% right. to get quality, to do good choices, get great information and to have the best experiences to, for me specifically that I've tailored. But I feel like we all have that within us to be able to come from that space of the heart and mm -hmm. creativity when we get out, especially when we get out of our own way. And especially when we're not listening to other people who exactly. may want the best for us, but sometimes they're so limited by their own beliefs and by what they were taught genera by generation that they don't know what they don't know and that they're putting on to us. So it's that fine line and it's that balance of the unknown with trust and faith, with trust and faith that you don't see, but it's a feeling to believe. Right. Yeah. No, I, you said it exactly right. Um, it just it, the way it's like, I'm trying to like compute it or at least uh, kind of get it the same, like on my scope of work. It's like, I feel like, and, and, and tell me what you think about this coming out, right? As far as like when you're born and everything, right? There's a certain start, like a start line, I guess you would say, you know, you can make, you can make the argument for which and where, where the start is at, but we all have a chance to excel in whatever we're going to do. Right. And there's only, even though there's only so many hours in a day, 24 hours in a day, we could choose what, ex what exactly, how we're going to be productive in that time frame, you know? And that's why I say like with you doing everything that you do and being so accomplished, accomplished internationally at that too, within 24 hours, it's like, Whoa, that's, that's a lot. Yeah. So yeah. In practical terms, if we're looking at uh, 24 hours in a day, you know, for most, mm -hmm. but what about with the people? And for artists and people who look at time as an illusion, who mm. don't look at time as 24 hours in a day mm -hmm. where, you know, time is just a man-made, made-up thing, right? Mm. Okay. Um, and so living life with brushstrokes in a different kind of way and kind of like the starting line that you said, I guess, you know, growing up running cross country, short term, medium term, long term goals gave me some foresight, but also to make me goal oriented um, mm -hmm. and being able to obtain a goal, set a goal. And then like, if I'm not going to do it on Tuesday, allow the space of kindness within myself, allow the space within myself, knowing I'm doing my best, I'm being my best, I'm showing up and crediting myself for showing up, but then also allowing if there's a hard stop, knowing, okay, this is a hard stop. I did it messy. I showed up. I did my best. This is all I can do. But also allowing, like, if it's due on Tuesday and like, oh, I'm going to, this is my goal. This is my target, but I'm going to actually extend it to Thursday. I need a little more time with that quote unquote time. Yeah. Um, you know, so being able to do that, I guess, from like having a start perspective and being a cross country runner. Also, another analogy would be um, Miguel, who wrote um, The Four Agreements. He also wrote a book called Mastery of Love. And I mm. feel if every human being read that book, it's the Toltec way. And basically, it's how I look at life is a white canvas and how I look at you in this conversation and me and whoever I'm associated with, even if I know them, I always show up with the white canvas. Mm -hmm. Because when we show up with the white canvas, even if you've known someone for five years, it's an opportunity to have a new conversation, right? right? But if you show up with the canvas of five years that we already know this person and the chair goes here and this person's going to be this way, there's no room for change. And the only mm. thing is that is constant is change. So I always approach life and any project I'm a part of with a white canvas, right? Like a yeah. blank slate blank or slate. like you, like you said, the, the start, like mm -hmm. when we start, right? We always have a, the choice to start again. We mm. always have the choice to start again. Yeah. No, that's powerful right there. Yeah. And I, I again, I just, I can reiterate, reiterate those same statements. It's like, the, I like the blank canvas. Like you said, that, that statement, like having that clean slate, uh, essentially not going into something with the, you know, pre, preset uh, notion on something, you know, just clean slate. Yeah. I like that one. Yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll send you the book. Yes, please. There's, oh, yeah. you know what? There is another one. Mm, I, I, I forget the exact title. 
but it's um something like the, the seven power seven seven powers of law or there was another 48 book. hours, 48, 48, hours? 48, 48 powers of law, Robert Greene. Yes. And then he, and then he actually did the 50th law with 50. And I was mm. in South Africa with 50, um, with, uh, on international tour when in, uh, 2008, when I was in South Africa with 50 mm -hmm. and G unit and I was on Patrice. He's the first, um, African American. Patrice um, O'Neill? No, Patrice, oh. <laughs> um, I'll have to look up his last name. Patrice, mm -hmm. he's in uh, Africa. He's the first African-American um, billionaire. Oh. He, the, he was an attorney. And in the 80s, he bought up a bunch of gold mines. Okay. And then um, he hosted us when we were in um, Africa. And mm -hmm. we were on his private jet flying from Johannesburg to uh, Cape Town. And oh, okay. we were we were on tour. Yeah. And, and, and on the plane, he announced to us he was doing the 50th law with Robert Greene. What? Look at yeah, that. That's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, hold on. How, what, you, 2008, 50 Cent G Unit. How did, what, what's the story on that? Yeah. So I had a grand opportunity. Um, so I did So Into You, this song. And mm -hmm. it was when I was going by Katie Coco when Lady mm -hmm. Gaga was getting her buzz. Like, mm -hmm. you know, and um, I saw Gaga perform at this place called Apple. It's on mm -hmm. Robertson across the street from um, the Abbey. And I was in the DJ booth with David Lopera mm -hmm. and and um, and uh, the fashion photographer uh, David LaChapelle was in the booth too. So it was like him, David, the DJ, and me, and we were watching Lady Gaga perform. And she had like this buzz about her, and she had like these five dancers around. It was just, like a really small stage, like four right. feet, like really small, but packed, right? Yeah, yeah. And Dave's brother at the time. Um, was going out with Gaga. So um, so that was kind of the synergy of it. And then I met Dave's like, yo, like, I want to uh, do your music video. I'm like, okay, so that music video is online. So into you. So okay. I did this song, So Into You, uh, that I wrote with uh, Luigi Gonzalez. And then um, my ex-partner was partners with um, um, – 50 cent they were like okay. doing stuff together it was the birth of them doing stuff together collaborating and chris lighty god bless his soul um you know he used to be 50s manager diddy's manager and great guy and unfortunately he's not with us anymore mm, and RP. and uh you know max partner pitched to uh chris lighty and 50 yo like let's have this artist like do her thing so what they yeah. did was they um, gave me an opportunity to to tour with 50 Cent and, um, and G-Unit in Europe. And we were in Europe on tour and we like were at dinner the night before and 50 was like, yo, like, do you want to like go, like go out and do your song? And then, Jeez. you know, I was, open, I was opening up for him and then yeah. in front of, in, in front of like 13, 18,000 people in Africa, but in Europe, oh, wow. like 13,000 people. He's like, do you want to come out go and do your song and then when i'm on stage come out and do it again and i'm like uh yeah 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 and in that moment i felt like michael jackson i felt like it was like a, a dope artist like michael jackson or something like giving an artist an opportunity and i was like For oh sure. yeah so there's footage online of like you know B banks and yayo mm -hmm. they're all they're going like this yep, yep, G -Unit. And, <laughs> and then backstage like i have my dressing room 50s dressing rooms next to me and you know there's footage of you know them saying like 50 saying like i'm gonna tell them to put their mother at the hands yeah. up and they're gonna do it and they did and they yeah, did yeah. and and so yeah so that was really cool it was like it was really cool and then you know 50 and i we did we did a couple movies together which is really cool but okay. i was able to see the birth of his um you know film the trajectory at least right before they did all the stuff that they have power before they did right. all of that like i was there when they partnered up and um, when 50 performed at like the place to perform at, yeah. in Sundance, you know, like all those, mm -hmm. all those beautiful, like new moments. And I was, it was cool to witness all of it, you know, and, right. and I was supposed to do quote unquote, mm -hmm. supposed to, no, I don't feel supposed to is actually a thing because if you're supposed to do something, you're going to do it, just gonna, but, right. but it didn't happen. But uh, mm -hmm. I was, it was, it was set up 
for me to do his American tour. And lastly, I was saying like Chris Lighty, mm -hmm. they, they put me on international tour first. They're like, you know, they're like, go on an international tour. And that's like, that's prepping you for when you come to America. So like mm. I was, I was going with no backup dancers. And I remember when I was in Africa with 50 in Cape town and he was like, you know, throwing me mad props because mm. He was like, yo, Mariah, J-Lo, like, they don't go out with, like, no dancers. Like, I was going out there by myself with no dancers she, internationally, yeah. like, performing. So it was it was really great and epic, epic moment. So oh, no, I'm, yeah. I'm very grateful. Such a memory, such an opportunity. And then, you know, just to be a part of all that and to say that you were behind the scenes. We're here fully invested in. And there's footage behind it to, like, prove everything, too. Man, what an experience. Yeah, it's really beautiful. And then and then after the international tour, like I said, quote unquote, was supposed to do the American tour. And then, mm -hmm. you know, like just things went in different directions. So that didn't happen, which is sadly unfortunate because then, you know, I could have, you know, taken steps to, um, you know, pursue my musical career in America where it mm -hmm. quote unquote really counts or whatever. But, but so that was kind of great in a moment. And then also... That's when I dismant, and then after when that that didn't happen, it kind of like I was I was set to perform at Wembley Stadium. Oh wow! Like Wembley, like that's yeah. you know the number Historically one historically. Yeah. Known. yeah. So yeah. I was I was set up. I was going to be performing there. So, you know, and that's really taking it to new heights. And then and then so after that, I ended up you know when things deteriorated, I ended up dismantling Katie Coco, kind of like like because looking at myself because people weren't really like getting my vibes and my sounds. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, I just, my life then took me into another direction. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I definitely understand that being pulled in different, different directions, you know, some, some say, you know, for the better, depends on how you look, you know, there's a lot of people, I don't know where you stand on it, but a lot of people that say they firmly believe that, you know, things happen for a reason. So you, 1, you get down to 1000%. Yeah, so yeah. I was going to say, because there's a lot of stuff that, you know, there's different paths that people could have gone to different avenues and everything. And sometimes, and I, I, this, I do believe in it too. It's just like, sometimes you have to let the pieces fall as they may, you know, and you're eventually, you're going to end up where you should have been or not should have been, but will be, if that makes sense. Totally. And I really learned and uh, feel along the way, uh, you know, if it quote unquote doesn't happen or, in the projected mind of the ego of the illusion of how it should happen or how you fantasize it to happen. Right. I mean, it's awesome to have that, but that's a tool and that's an anchor and it's a knowing, but also there's this thing called life, you know, yeah. that we're all experiencing. Yeah. So the unknown is beautiful and not knowing is a part of the bliss because it's supposed to be that way. In mm -hmm. addition, if it quote unquote, doesn't work out how it's supposed to, then it's time to really look within. And it took a long time for me to, uh, circle back around and I needed to do some internal work because when we do the internal work and then we show up, it all falls into place because we're not projecting and putting things on onto an exterior thing that could fall out of place. Because once you're so solid inside like an oak tree, it doesn't matter if it sways to the left or right, up and down in between, mm -hmm. because there's just this, you know, subtlety and knowing and stillness from within where without doesn't really matter, you know? Yeah. No, yeah, for sure. I mean, this, it's, it's just like, like you said, there's this crazy thing called life <laughs> that kind of <laughs> takes us all, all over the place and all of those hurdles and those leaps and those bounds that we, you know, fortunately have to go through for the better problem, you know, if we're looking in hindsight for, for, uh, for the better. And I'm sure there's a bunch of past experiences and traumas and stuff like that. We, we can like point and give specific details to be like stuff like this happened for a reason that led me here. You know, well, er, that's beautifully said and everything, you know, based on certain circumstances, it's like, oh, it's some doesn't make sense. Oh, it sounds woo woo. Everything's supposed to be how it happens. But, mm -hmm. you know, in some unfortunate things. But if you saw the movie Soul, you know, and shout out to the viewer and the listener tuning in, mm -hmm. we appreciate you being here and holding mm -hmm. space. And if you checked out the movie Soul, it, it gives you a visual explanation to for humans to understand there's something and there's a lot of people who believe that we chose the life that we have. It's like, mm -hmm. why would we choose this? And then you unravel and it's a discovery. You know, it's, it's really, I am an advocate for mental health and for trauma. Same. And yeah. So Gabor Mate um, has an amazing documentary called 
the wisdom of trauma and he has amazing videos. I mean, I went one day and I binged for 16 hours by myself and I just filled up on Gabor Mate. So we mm. all have trauma, no matter if it's comparison, worse or better than someone else. It's not okay to discredit my own trauma or for one to discredit their own trauma because someone's had it worse. Yeah. yeah. A lot of people's had it worse and a lot of people quote unquote have it better. And I would dismantle my own trauma because of other people, because, you know, I didn't grow up here. My mm -hmm. parents aren't divorced. They didn't drink in the house. They mm -hmm. didn't do drugs. So I would dismantle my own traumas because I wasn't like what I taught was bad. So mm -hmm. Gabor Mate is the specialist and the healer and I'm a vessel and an advocate like you are, Albert. So you can, you know, check out the Gabor Mate and go on a binge. He's amazing um, awesome. for understanding trauma and understanding how we're all connected and how we un how we all have trauma. Yeah, no, I well, for yeah, I definitely got to get that. I want to write that down in here in a little, little bit to check that out. And I also just it, it's um, funny that we bring this up too because I've in these last two previous or not two, but in the last a few episodes that I've done on, my, on this podcast, I've talked about that about um, going to therapy and then finding alternative ways that are therapeutic that's not necessarily in office, you know, traditionally in a meeting with a person for the people that are just adjusting to that type of thing. You know, I've, I've talked about doing those uh, therapeutic alternatives. And also I, I had um, uh, 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 a girl here who was a trauma survivor who was in, involved in a car accident. And she was talking about all this stuff, developing PTSD from that, you know, and the, I mean, the, the feedback from it, the reception that it received and every, uh, the people that were, you know, messaging me and talking about how they can relate to that or they know where she's coming from. And then people discovering that, like, oh, this, I do have this. And maybe there's, it's not just physical uh, PTSD. There's emotional PTSD, there's mental PTSD, and then everything that's just traumatic, you know what I mean? So that's the thing that, that, that hit and stuck with me the most. I'm so happy you're bringing this up. And it's so great that you're speaking on this topic. And that's why we're here together, you know, mm -hmm. uh, and that's why we do what we do as podcasters to yeah. be able to communicate this language and to make it more uh, normal instead of being silent like we were like I was mentioning earlier was silently suffering right. but I I uh, heard you on that episode and then I saw you with the the female and I mm -hmm. saw video on that so I was able to check those out and I was like oh cool cool I'm like yeah, yeah. I'm like I'm like couples therapy like totally yes. makes sense then for for your audience and yeah and also, um, you know, what I would like to sh uh, share on this subject is Please. like what you were saying, like about this, uh, what I was saying about the silently suffering, that's the, that's the abuse. That's not only a bruise on the physical body, mm -hmm. but the, uh, the, the mental abuse, the emotional abuse, the abuse of the energy and the, the, the abuse of our choices. And, and for example, like CPS, child protective services mm -hmm. for years now. I mean, I don't have children yet. God willing, one day it'll happen if it's meant to be right. But mm -hmm. uh, and if I make good choices for, for it to happen, <laughs> yeah. uh, but uh, child protective services. Like I said, I don't have children yet, but it, I mean, there are so many forums of what people are saying about child protective services. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, let's go to the root in child protective services. I have an email unless the child has a cracked open skull with blood <laughs> dripping down or they go and the, the house doesn't have uh, running water. Mm -hmm. I mean, I mean, you know, or, or electricity, or yep. if the mom's drugged up right then and there, unless they're in the act of Im imminent danger, when they show up to the house, they won't take the kids. The last thing um, the child protective services want to do, and I understand the last thing they want to do is break up a family, right? Mm -hmm. However, instead of being at a 50%, they're lowballing it so low mm -hmm. that unless they have what I just shared, they won't take the child out. However, if, if we're talking about what we're talking about, because the kids are petrified, the kids yeah. are scared that they're going to be taken away. The kids are so scared. They don't know that child protective services isn't going to lock you up and put you away. The very last thing they want to do is put you away. They have so many kids without homes. The very first thing they do is they go to family. They go, they exhaust family 
because they want the child to be in a safe home with the family, not wanting to lock the kid up, not putting the kid away, but kids are so scared and they don't know. And there's not mm -hmm. enough communication on this and educated people on this where, you know, they're so scared, but also CPS, Child Protective Services is so underpaid. So what I want to also share is the root cause of we're all children. We're yeah. all children that turn into adults. And when your children, they're empathetic, you feel guilty, poor children, they're helpless, blah, blah, blah. Those same children are their statistics, they go off to murder people, do drugs, get killed, um, you know, abuse, child abuse, sexual abuse. Like they go with these uh, they these children who were abused, who weren't protected by the system, they and and when they're helpless, then they go and they become adults. But when they become adults, they're monsters, they're mm -hmm. bad, they're horrible people. No, they're just big kids who yeah. were conditioned and who weren't protected by the root cause of the system. So we need to have an alliance and more doctors and more people like us advocates who are speaking up on these topics because I mean, we're all divided by states. I mean, yeah. we're in America here. So if I'm talking yeah. about like the United States of America, then it's broken down into states having their own laws of when emancipation is illegal, w legal, excuse me, when child emancipation is legal, when um, getting a, a guardianship, what age, and you know, I know in Michigan, it's 14, right? And there's, so each state has different laws. There's so many laws that are locked down and that are binded by things that are so unjust and it's causing so much havoc and it's causing so much turmoil onto our planet, right? And mm -hmm. that's why there's so many issues and problems. Like we really need to deal with child protective services and really protecting our children. Because like I said, we're all children. We are all children. Even when we're adults, we're all children. And the ones who do not have the childlike spirit, artistic, creative, mm -hmm. white canvas uh, outlet of being an artist, um, they just had their fires burnt out mm -hmm. too quickly. And we're told, yeah. like, like, I just want to give an example. Here's, here's something that's hypocritical for you, okay? Yeah. When we're kids, we're taught color, color, all the colors. You're coloring. You're, you love rainbows. You love angels. You're drawing. You're drawing. Now, if I'm into color and I'm drawing, people are like, are you gay? I'm like, they wait a minute. Was I was... Coloring. I was, I was told as a kid to love color, to love rainbows, to love angels. Like there's princesses and unicorns on everything and little kids dress. But when I'm a young adult, mm -hmm. now I'm looked at like, are you're like attacking my character? Wondering, mm -hmm. um, are you gay? Like, wasn't, wasn't I taught to love rainbows yeah. <laughs> and, and colors yeah. and now I'm being judged for it? Like how hypocritical is that? How is it? Yeah. No, I think. Ugh. I think, the, you know, the biggest thing and the main thing that stands out for me, I mean, you touched on it and you said it earlier ago, it's communication, you know, the lack of there, I should say. The communication, I mean, if, if in all layers, you know, I feel like if there was a better, not necessarily a standard, but if there was a uh, better communication and understanding between all this other stuff, even the little details, you know, just the smallest details for, for communication would help out and pay, pay dividends in the long run, you know? Yeah. Uh, well, speaking on what you're talking about, which I am totally intently aware of now, you know, uh, for example, misophonia. Do you know what misophonia mm -hmm. is? I very vaguely, I don't want to okay, yeah. I don't want to lie and say I know for sure. So there's uh, misophonia. There's HSP, highly sensitive persons. 16 to 20% of the population are highly sensitive people. I, I have misophonia. I'll, I'll share what that is in a minute. Uh, there's HSP. I'm definitely an HSP. I'm mm -hmm. an ambivert. So I'm extroverted and introverted. Yep, I know I, that one. I need to be, so I need to have solitude. I need to be in silence. Um, I need to go in my cocoon to kind of reinvent myself before then I, then I'm like, I have it so full it, that it bursts out of me as an extrovert. And I like put it out there, like you said, all over the place with all the things I do. But the reason why I can do all the, the, the things that I do is because I'm able, as I put them out, I'm able to go in and get it from within and put it out. There's um, sensory processing, 
disorder. So people wow. who are heightened with their, their sensory processing. So I'm very sensitive to light, um, mm. artificial light. Um, I'm very sensitive to noises. Uh, my autonomic nervous system, it starts like going like this and freaking out. Wow. My nervous system just starts freaking out. The number one thing at, we all have in common when we're born as a human being is our heart. We have yeah. over 40,000 neurons in our heart. We have our heart. And then after our heart, the second thing is our nervous system. Our brain is a tool that's developed six, um, over 60 to 70,000 thoughts per day, right? According to Dr. Joe Dispenza, who I, I love, but it's our nervous system. And so we're emotional beings. So ev everything's a hit of intuition, our heart and our gut, our first brain knows and then it goes to, you know, our reptilian brain, you know, three different parts of our brain. And then it goes to the mind. But we're primal beings, as Mastery of Love will tell you, Miguel, where it's like if a bus is coming, we're not thinking, oh, a bus is coming. I better jump. No, you mm -hmm. jump. You just jump out of the way. We're primal. Right. We're instinctive. Inst so, yeah. so what you said about the detail of communication and the detail of empathy, it's like, like, like be kind to people. We really, and we've heard, oh, we don't know what other people are going through. We really don't understand what people are going through. And how can we understand what other people are going through when most people don't understand what's going on with themselves? Mm, yep. No, yeah. I mean, that's, that is true. I mean, I would say too, even you, you can, um, I can go back and even just call out myself hypocritically, if, but call out, calling out myself too, because at the times or what I thought was a norm or being conditioned in a certain way to think or to react or know what's around me, we didn't know, I myself included, like I said, I didn't mind not know this was going on at that time until maybe right now me like, oh, at that time, I didn't, I didn't realize what was going on, but now that I do, you know, and that's, you know, that's, that's a, a time thing. And like I said, having the, um, consciousness, the consciousness, exactly. Consciousness. So, yeah. There, there yeah. is, there is all, I mean, even, you know, you can, now that we speak about it and everything, there's certain, like, like we were talking about, like, um, the, I'm sorry, what was it again? HSP? Yeah. Highly I, sensitive person. Highly sensitive person. Yeah. HSP. I mean, I, I can, I can, now that I hear it and understand it more, even right now, I can just point and be like, oh, I know what they're going through now. Oh yeah. That, that sounds exactly like what this friend has or my, uh, a family member of mine, or, you know, it just, it's more common, I guess now than ever. Yeah. And the thing is, it's like, you know, an HSP, like a lot, a highly sensitive person, they walk around thinking something's wrong with them. Right. Mm -hmm. That comes from trauma. When Gabor Mate explains like there's, there's two choices and the easier choice when you're a kid is to, if mommy and daddy are mad is to think it's your fault. So then we think mm -hmm. it's our fault that someone else is mad when we're a kid. And then we take that along with us on our journey, like a but also trip. because yeah. And then our shame and blame and, mm -hmm. and exactly. And then all, uh, also it's like, if people aren't as sensitive as we are, you know, or they're desensitized because of their environment of being brainwashed of what they're watching, uh, they've been desensitized by their environments of what they were taught. And then they're just teaching us the same thing. Um, you know, it's the artists who revolt against it. It's the rebellious people who, you know, make their own choice and decide on their own belief and protect it, not knowing what it is, but protect it, right? Like knowing there's something unique about me. There's something different. I don't know what it is. And it's one of the reasons why I've been on a hunt for so long. Like, oh, what I was going to say is misophonia. Um, if you want to put in the show notes, I actually had uh, Tom, who is the president of the Misophonia Institute on my podcast. I'm sure he would love to come on your podcast. I can make an sure. intro yeah. and you can have him on for an episode. He's a genius. And uh, but you could put in the show notes so people can listen more in depth and learn about misophonia yeah. and what it is. But he uh, is a behaviorist and he found out through, you know, working with a lot of kids that pe I mean, he'll tell his story better than me, but a lot of people were coming and they would get so mad, like with a sound or a touch or something, they would mm. get so mad. And, you know, a lot of people think they're just cranky or, you know, they just, they're enraged or they're upset, but no, actually it's called misophonia and it's a muscle and it's a, an intuitive hit that happens. And we don't know that it happens because we think it just goes from hearing it to what goes on in the brain of being mad or the sound for me, specifically motors, anything with the motor, a hair blow dryer, um, weed whacker, someone mowing the lawn. Like what happens is what I found out, I'll stop breathing. I'll stop mm. breathing. And when I stop breathing, then all of a sudden my nerves will start going like this. So I have to scuba breathe and start breathing in really slow 
as long as I can and, and out, slow in, slow out. And I found, you know, once I practiced that, um, all of a sudden the sim, the, the, the reaction goes down like instantaneously. Also there's the misophonia app and it's free. So, uh, it's a train, they're just trained muscles, intelligent muscles in our body. And it is curable without taking any prescription pills. But a lot of, they say like he, on the podcast, he says like one out of every 10 or two out of every 10 people or three, maybe out of every 10 have misophonia and they just don't know it. Like most of us have misophonia and just don't know it. Oh, I have a friend now that now that um, I think about it, I have a friend who I can't stand or be around a person that they can audibly hear them chew. They have to leave. Like it's, it, misophonia. It's, soon, yep, they, it, it's like the chewing of of anything, ice, popcorn, and as long as they can hear it, like a bag of chips in a car, they literally have to leave. And they're, they're like, I can't be in the car and they have to leave. And so he has a thing where you do a test and it's free and you can find out where it is on you. For me, I was stopping breathing, like I said, but, um, it more in depth, um, on the podcast, like I was even asking, like, what do I do? Like, yeah. what, what do you tell people? And you can listen to it so he can, you know, tell you, but this one short example I give on the podcast is like, I was with one of my shamans and we were leaving Republic of Pie on Magnolia in LA, which is amazing if you love pie. <laughs> Who doesn't love a good I know. pie? <laughs> <laughs> and um, when we were walking out, it was like a really cool, hip, busy street. So there's all these like hot people, edgy, cool, hippie, like like her, like her, North Hollywood people mm -hmm. pre-pandemic. And, and a fire truck was going and there's a light and it was so loud and it was my ears. I had to put my fingers in my ears and thank God my shaman is shaman Harry Paul and he's amazing or else anyone else would be like, what is this girl? Do? Like if I wasn't who I was, they'd be like, who is this girl? Like, what is she doing? And the best thing I could have done was go back inside and like be like, tell the friend like, oh, I have to go to the bathroom. So you don't have to like explain because you can't explain when you're in the moment what happens because mm. You get hijacked, like your nervous system hijacks your rational cortex, your prefrontal mm. cortex like shuts down and you go into like survival mode. So the smartest thing I could have done was now I know here's a tool when I'm not in it, tr like triggered, um, what I can do when I'm in a situation, not that I've been in my, many public situations at all during this time, but when yeah. I am again, I can know, excuse myself, I'm going to go to the bathroom. And then also another thing he taught me was like, if you're with someone and they don't know you well or something, you can just say oh, it's on the podcast, but he, he would in he'll in his words, but it was like, if you don't know this person really well, you can just be like, you know, I have this condition with this reflex mm. and, and just kind of like diffusing it. And if you let yeah. people know, like, Hey, I have this condition thing where you have to like, let them know. He said, most people are really friendly and they'll get it and they'll be mindful. Otherwise you can just, move tables or like, you know, excuse yourself from the situation. So maybe your friend can listen to the episode and learn some tools of how he can deal with it because it's so hard thinking you, are, you can't explain it to people. Cause like I said, like, how does he explain it when he probably doesn't even know what it is. Right. Mm -hmm. But once Not you understand, sorry, once you, once you understand, it's like, it's like, oh, there's this space and there's this permission to be me and know I'm sensitive and I have this and I'm okay with that and to own it and instead of feeling bad or trying to hide from it and just really like owning it and creating more space for self, like take up more space in the world, you know? Mm -hmm. So, so I'm really, I'm really happy just once you know, like, I feel happy about that, just knowing, but what right. were you saying? No, I was going to say it's um, the first thing that came to mind just when you, when you were saying about like, you know, it being able to tell or give a heads up to a person you know and be like hey this is the condition i have you know that's like a formal heads up and it's like a courtesy i think i guess you know um but the first thing that came to mind was i don't know if you saw this movie or not but the movie joker there was a scene where he's on the bus and um he's having this thing he has a condition where he like randomly starts laughing at certain stuff and he just breaks out of laughing out of nervousness and um while that's happening he hands the the, the people in front of him it was like this mom with uh with their child and he hands them a card that in the card basically explains like, hi, this is why this is what I the condition I have. And this is, okay. you know, what uh, what goes on. And it was interesting to get the response or to see the response that that woman did instead of I guess you could go a different uh, bunch of different ways to go about it. But she initially just got up and just walked away and took her, her child away, you know, but in that scene, mm -hmm. it shows that reaction of, you know, how it can be and how it can be received when you, when you have something like that. So mm -hmm. that, like I said, kind of random, but that's just what yeah. popped into my head. 
when you, when and you it's the film's called joker yeah it's called joker it was uh with came out last year i want to say it was with joaquin phoenix and um uh wow. he plays uh the joker on it but it's it's a you know it's a it's a i i, I personally enjoy the movie i saw it twice and it, it's it's pretty direct it's um it's gory it's violent Ooh. But it's it's okay <laughs> see with misopho- misophonia like Ooh. i i i watch jason and freddie but i don't watch scary movies i don't oh, okay. watch the news i i can't i can't even hear about like gunshots and killings and the things mm, happening okay. I, I i'm my i'm very sensitive to those with my sensory processing i'm really sensitive to those things emotionally i get very emotional Oy. so i don't own a tv i don't watch news oh, okay uh, i really protect my mind and I protect my ears too, um, because there's emotional and um, you know, there's toxicity. Um, yeah. for example, like walking down the street of New York and a guy screaming on the phone, mm. F this, F that. It's like, what about your social environment? What about children who could be hearing you speak? Mm-hmm. Like it's a responsibility to um, you know, to communicate in a social setting. And it's a I think it's a responsibility as a human to be aware of your vessel because we are only getting one here on this planet right now mm, that, okay. that I know of. So yeah. I'm very aware of what I watch, uh who I listen to, who I speak with. Right. I'm very aware of those things. Like I'm I'm very open. I'm an open book. Like yeah. I'm not gonna, you know, I'll try like anything once. Like if I know I'm not it's not gonna harm me, right? Right. Um so, or, or harm somebody else, but I like to be open to trying things, but I'm not going to put myself in a position, especially with getting to know myself more. I'm not going to put myself in a position where it's going to hurt me. And like you said, it's not only physically hurting, but it's emotionally hurting me. Right. I get emotionally hurt. It's painful. It hurts my, 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 my body, like mm-hmm. my mind, my body, like it, it hurts. Like oh, I, yeah. oh, I don't want to feel that. I don't yeah, wanna... that that'll literally affect your mood for could be a day, it could be a week, and just it just turns everything upside down, you know. Yeah. But that it's really good that you are self centered, and that way you you know yourself, and you know exactly you know the things that are for you and are not, you know, because unfortunately there's a lot of us that you know not necessarily have the strength, the courage, and the uh, the discipline to do that, you know. So that's positive on your end too. Yeah, I really feel. Thank you. I really feel probably my uh, Greek roots mm-hmm. and you know, my culture and understanding diversity yeah. and also cross country running. Not that any, not that I feel uh, like all children need to go on to the Olympics. However, I feel it's a great foundation when you're especially young, but even now to be active involved because it really gave me that root of that oak tree to really go for goals and put myself first. So it really gave me this strong structure Um, you know, before I went out into the world. And so I feel if there's an opportunity to have kids definitely uh, work out and be active in sports to understand um, community and uh, team being a team player, because as a cross country runner, you know, I have a team, but what I do as an individual affects the whole. And I apply that principle to life. What I do as an individual counts for the team numbers so it kind of gave me a mindfulness of having care and compassion for other people because it's going to be reflective on me and what they do is reflective on them no yeah for sure i mean it's these these type of conversations and these topics and, and everything that we're hitting right now these are the ones that you know some people either are dying to hear or they not necessarily are so vocal within themselves or have the courage enough themselves to speak about these type of things you know and so uh, yeah, I'm just all, I'm here for it, for it all. <laughs> Me too. I mean, it's why I show up. And I, like yeah. I said, I was silent for a long time, you know? And so my goal is to be a ripple effect for each individual one at a time. And when, you know, Gandhi says, you know, the um, change yourself, we change the world. I'm fragmenting his famous quote, but mm-hmm. And people think it's woo -woo or don't identify and don't understand. And the people who aren't speaking up because they're confused and we were conditioned, we were conditioned and taught things with certain languages. So sometimes we don't have the language. For example, when we're babies, we feel so much, but we don't know words. We don't know our ABCs. We don't have the language yet. Right. Mm -hmm. But when you see something, a movie, or you hear a song, you're like, oh, I feel that. Or like, oh, now I now I know the word for it, but I didn't 
know the word misophonia. I didn't know HSP. I didn't, I didn't know this language. I didn't understand trauma. There's an amazing book, um, Attachments, and it uh, shows you the different attachment styles. And I didn't know attachments and then understanding attachments. And then it took a long time for me to sit with my family and then see my attachment style of my family. And then people always saying to me, someone who just wrote me that I've known for since 2003, I've always admired your Greek roots, how close you are with your family. Yeah, but maybe I could be a little too close to my family. You know, there's like, it's, yeah, it's cool, fault. but there's, it, it's, it's cool when you have relationships with your family, but sometimes, sometimes I've made choices based on my family and maybe choices have held me back from quote unquote opportunities that would have had mm -hmm. me go certain directions with my career mm -hmm. that would be identified for other people in life as success. But my quote unquote family, um, they don't know, but right. I do psychologically my own attachment. I'm attached in a way that's healthy, but I feel like I'm attached in a ways that are unhealthy. And then sitting with my mom and dad one time, I was just like with my family hanging out. And I noticed, and I didn't know this until it happened, but when my mom left the kitchen and she was done with the laundry and she left the kitchen, I was subtly sitting there and aware I wanted to immediately leave and go into the other room and talk to her more. I realized mm. I was more emotionally attached to my mother mm. than my father, which gave me a whole new insight of the attachment style. And I mean, Dr. Hawkins talks about this on YouTube. It's a short, like three, four minute video about like when you're stuck and the attachment that we have with an idea or a thought that that one consciousness, that consciousness of that thought of the attachment, mm. just mentally being attached to an individual or this thing attaches us to so many other things and anchors us in so many other unhealthy patterns and things. So to be consciously aware of that and then to unhook from it, like is very powerful and it takes consciousness, subtlety of the work because no one's going to tell you that. And it's only through being so mindful, aware of in the moment of your thoughts, your mm -hmm. beliefs, and with being all over the place, sometimes it's really difficult to do, but I was, and I see the work that I need to do to un unleash and attach, but I was able to do it by being present and spending time with my mom and dad too, facing that music, facing my family to be in the eye of the storm, to confront that very thing I maybe ran from, mm -hmm. which took me all over the place around the world. So it's wild because it's like a double-edged sword, right? The yeah. very thing... Like my podcast, she's all over the place. The very thing that gave me such ambition to see the world is, you know, the attribute to my culture, my goals, my family, you know, all the things we're talking about, the attachment styles. I was able to like leave and travel the world and do all these things. And it kept me from facing the music and the truth. But then that very same thing is what kept me so still and present to be able to have the courage, like you said, to face those things as well, mm -hmm. to kind of have turn over a new leaf and, and have full circle of a clean white canvas. Lastly, I want to say about this topic that I feel like I'll, I feel like a lot of individuals don't have the experience that I just talked about because most people, when they leave home, they get into relationships. They never come back home. They get mm -hmm. into partnerships. They have children, they get married, they go create their own family. And then they come back and they visit with their partners or their families, but they don't have that solitude of a time with themselves to fully develop as a human being. And my goal to myself when I was really young, I knew I was gonna have children later on in life, God willing, but I've been birthing all these things that you talked about at the beginning of the episode. Mm -hmm. Those have been my babies. I've been birthing that. I wanted to have a full on experience of being human and understanding why I'm here because I definitely know when you bring life, it's not only about us anymore. It's about giving everything to them. But then I've also learned there's some lenient truths to that as well, because mm -hmm. not only is it a part of me, but I get to share that with another life that I God willingly create. And we go on a beautiful journey together. So, you know, with, you know, over two, two decades of that experience, I really wanted to be able, be able to fill up my own cup because- right. 
you don't get a second shot to make a first impression when mm-hmm. when it's when it's been gifted to you. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, no, I mean, I, as that's the thing about when it comes to parenting, and when it, when um, you know, like you said, you are right when you say that once the uh, the child is born, the uh, everything turns not necessarily upside down, but it's like the priorities shift and, and the priorities change. But even in that, like I said, there's I know there's um, parents who have some sort of resentment, even though because they feel like they had you know. Uh, 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 a child at a young age and then there's some resentment because they feel like because this happened that they would have you know been here in this life and had this not happened then they would have been successful in in this part of, in this journey you know so there is that too and that's why it um it is good that you were able to like i said travel the world and get all these experience and be you know have your hand in, in, in so many different baskets and to be able to uh, get that knowledge and the experience before bringing a child to the world what you just said is so impactful and powerful. Exactly. It's a knowing. And how was I so young knowing this and seeing this because I'm so sensitive? (laughs) Mm -hmm. Uh, But yeah, and I've seen it. There's all the resentment and the kids get all the blame. And because they didn't fulfill their cup and fully understand themselves, they projected it and they blame their children and they put Mm -hmm. it onto their children. And that's not fair for the child. And I didn't want to do that. I didn't want to put do that and naturally life is going to take its course but i definitely needed to create space so i would be mindful not to do that because it's unfair and i know life is unfair but also it's like i didn't i want i had so many ambitions and goals that i wanted to fulfill that i didn't want to do what you just said and blame someone else that's why i'm not married that's Mm -hmm. why i've had gentlemen callers and i didn't go all the way with a lot of them because i felt like it would be taking away um, you know, my focus of what I wanted to do. And I saw along the journey. And of course, there's different experiences. A dramatic one would be being a trophy wife or, you know, dismantling your ambitions because they want to produce families and, mm-hmm. and children. Although in the times of now, women still, um, you know, can have full on careers and fathers are staying home or mm-hmm. they can still have children. But do work with their children. I'm in entertainment. So my child could be the model. My child could be the son or daughter if I'm acting or if I'm doing music or, you know what I mean? They can be involved if I'm a DJ and I'm doing daytime charity events for, you know, companies. And, you know, I'm not at the nighttime doing DJ gigs with like, you know, drugs and stuff in the nightclubs. Mm -hmm. Like my scene would be more like, you know, charities and daytime events and where my child could potentially be there if they're, you know, at a certain age. And so it's not like you have to stop your life. You might take moments out to nourish and cherish those beautiful things with your child. Um, You know, so, so that's really exciting to know too, you know, that um, I would probably want to dismantle and take time out um, when I have children, like I have, you know, like everyone did during the pandemic Mm -hmm. and, you know, really go to lengths of exploring my internal life and, you know, designing a platform, God willing for the next two decades of my life, you know, Mm -hmm. I've been able to take the, this last year, year and a half to do that. Mm -hmm. Uh, before I was, you know, traveling in the world for two decades when I left Michigan. Mm -hmm. And so for me, I feel like it's all coming really full circle. Yeah, no, that's a good, and that's a good thing to have. And it's a good thing to talk about. And there's nothing wrong with saying like, Hey, I want to prioritize myself right now and set myself up and build up those building blocks for the future. You know, in a perfect world, I think a lot of people would prefer to take that route, given the opportunity, you know? Um, so I think the opportunity's there. They just need to take it. It's oh, yeah, there. Definitely. Even, even by circumstance, even by excuse, it's, it's putting self first over and over and over again. And you keep doing it and you keep showing up to the mat and keep putting self first, always putting self first, unless we're giving to ourselves first, we can't truly give to another. Yes. You said it right. Um, now also, there's a couple of different things um, that I want to talk about, if it's okay with you. Um, oh, totally. Some of the work, some of the work that you've done. I mean, I'm just just out of curiosity myself. Voice acting. I mean, what like, what is that process like? I mean, you've been awarded. You've you know, there's so many accolades there. Um, talk to me about how you got into that and um, where it stands at today. 
voiceovers are awesome. Oh my gosh. I mean, I had, it was such a gift because everyone has their own journey in life and everyone has their own journey with voiceovers. And when I was a teenager, I, uh, living in Michigan, I booked a pizza commercial. I was this 14 year old girl um, for a pizza commercial. And while we were on set at the end, they're like, oh, we love her voice. We want to book her for the voiceover too. So back then they had fax machines and they literally in the moment were ethical because mm -hmm. I was a kid. I was a kid. I don't know. They could have totally just taken advantage of me, which they people in the industry do to artists all the time. Right. And um, and so they faxed over a contract to my agent. And not only did I book an on-screen commercial, but I booked my first voiceover gig before I even knew what voiceovers were as a wow. teenager living in Michigan. And then I went to California and I was with an amazing agency called Abrams Artists. And they're like, they're called A3 Artists now. Uh, I'm with them in New York uh, mm -hmm. right now. I'm with them. They're one of the top agencies in New York. Um, but I was with them in LA. And when the, the commercial, when you're doing on-screen commercial mm -hmm. and voiceovers, they're in the same like office next to each other. But TV and film, they're like uh, uh, in another area of the office. There's like literary for like the lit department for the writing scripts representation. Then there's the TV film, which is completely different. You would think if TV film would be the same as commercials because mm -hmm. they're both on TV, but they're not. They're different. TV and film are very different. But commercials like that you see and voiceovers, they go together. So wow. the commercial department hired me. And when they hired me, they just signed me as a voiceover artist too. And I was going out for all these voiceover commercials. And it was back in the day where it's like you had a time slot, you drove to the agency, you they gave you the copy 10 minutes before, then you go into the booth with the director, they direct you. And then the next person goes in every five minutes. And that's how it was. Now I'm in my home studio. I can be in Bali. I can be international anywhere in the world. I can do my voiceovers. They, they email them to me from my iPad. You don't have to, you know, you just read the voiceovers, video games, TV, commercials, uh, animation, TV mm -hmm. series. So like, like the He-Man one that my dad just marathon that's out right now. Like I went out mm -hmm. for one of the roles and I'm going to walk, I'm going to marathon it, but, um, I went out for one, yeah, I went out for one of the roles and my job people as, as a voiceover artist, your job is to audition. That's your job. It's not the booking. When you get the booking, that's like the cherry on the cake. That's like, mm -hmm. oh, once once you get the booking, you're like, oh, cool. But the actual check that you're getting is from like the 99 other no's that you heard right. while you were auditioning. Because what you make in 15 minutes is like what someone would make like in a month sometimes, right. you know, or like yeah. in a year. I mean, it just depends. It's very lucrative. It's right a lot of fun. It's so cool. There's so many areas of voiceover voiceovers. A lot of times they'll give, they'll give three references. One, they'll give a celebrity prototype. So they're like the cus the client's going for this kind of vibe. And mm -hmm. so a lot, I get like Alicia Silverstone, uh, Demi Moore, uh, mm. Emma, Emma Stone, uh, Scarlett Johansson, nonstop. I'm like number one for, uh, uh, Scarlett Johansson and Emma Stone. Cause I have that like raspy kind of voice right mm -hmm. so my uh, one of my coaches he's amazing says i have the golden voice in voiceovers because a lot of people will train to get that like raspy grit voice right mm -hmm. so and that's great for animation and in video games a lot of times you're just speaking it's interactive you're speaking to the player right video right. games it's you're either the player or you're like talking to the player and so it's more grounded like a conversation and you're just instructing them like what to do or like checking in with them but it's not a like a big animated voice mm -hmm. sometimes but most of the times it's like um just your real voice uh animation is my bread and butter it's a lot of fun like um i'm a cartoon character i'm branded as cartoon katie for my voiceovers yeah um and it's so cool because voiceovers it's a very small industry and although it's opened up internationally because now everyone has home studios right. prior to the pandemic i had a home studio because of my social anxiety mm -hmm. um like for me to get into a car, to go to my agency, to like see the people and be like, do you like me still? Like, I'm like so paranoid and so oh. insecure. Like a maybe I feel like maybe a lot of people are or aren't, but, um, mm -hmm. but like, you know, getting into the car to drive 30 minutes in traffic when it's super hot, when mm. you're in LA to go to Warner brothers or yeah. go to 
Paramount to park in like one of their nine structures with thousands mm-hmm. of cars and then walk to security where there could be people there uh, going to see like a TV show or on a, on a, on a tour or something. And then you have to bring a bag to like bring your heels. So you're not walking across the, the parking lot where it's like all black and you know, you're walking, you know, for 15 to 40 minutes to this bungalow to like then get there 15 minutes early. So you can like cool down from like melting and then change into your heels and then make sure your nervous system is all calmed down. Now I'm switching to like being an on-screen actor and then to sign in in this bungalow where you're waiting and there's like maybe a couple girls ahead of you. And then after you, where you're going in for five minutes to do like an on-screen reading, like I rather do self tapes from home. Same mm-hmm. thing with voiceovers. It's not that intense because you know, you're able to read right off the iPad or right from the copy, but if I can do it from home and, you know, anywhere in the world, let's do that. Um, and it's about like booking the job and the quality of my voice. I rather, I rather do that than, you know, showing up for an audition and, you know, I love clients and I love people. I do, but Hey, like if, if you can be in San Francisco, which I've, you know, had clients and it's like, they're on the Skype and yeah. they're just directing me on audio. You save time, money for the environment, emissions, gas, mm-hmm. oil. Like it's, it's just more, it's I'm more conscious and aware actually like we're connecting like this and yeah, we yeah. can meet up in person and we can, but also it's like, we're kind of doing it doing right here. The yeah. same thing, except right like here. you can hang up and like have your dinner and like, and not drive in nine hours of traffic. And, yeah. but I mean, we could still obviously meet up to create and do things mm-hmm. on different terms. Um, but you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. No, but I, I feel, I... Oh, oh, I'm sorry. I was just, I was sorry. I was lastly going to say, I feel like because of the pandemic, more people have, you know, are more hybrid now and Mm -hmm. seeing how it's consciously better, not only for the quality of human beings, Mm -hmm. and it's really upgrading us as humans to be able to connect, but in in new ways, because then we have space for the unknown that can fill our souls. Mm -hmm. No, that's exactly what I was going to talk about too, which was, you know, I think that um, you know, to your point, I think the uh, the pandemic taught us that it, and taught companies and corporations that, you know, you can work mobily and you don't have to be in this exact spot. You don't have to have these set hard times and have the people um, adjust and, you know, have have to alter their lifestyles or have to alter their time to meet this specific thing. When we can do that, be just as productive mobily. So that's what I was yeah. going to hint at. Love it. Yeah. It changes company politics. It changes social politics. Mm-hmm. I mean, it changes in the way we communicate with one another. For example, I mean, if I'm sharing with you like who I am and I have maybe quote unquote social anxiety for the reasons I mentioned, mm-hmm. um, I, I can't imagine what other people feel. And imagine those people who, like you said earlier, don't have the voices and the courage to speak up because they're going to get in trouble. I mean, it's like, it's like we're adults in school. Like you're going to get in trouble. You're bad if you bring that up or you don't want to lose your job. And so a lot of times we're, we're making choices, decisions. They're not really choices. So we're making decisions. There's a difference. Right. We're making decisions from a fear-based place. We're making the decisions from our root chakra for, for our security, for, for, our, for our homes, for our you know, circumstances, if we, have a par- if we have a partner, if we have, you know, children, um, for me specifically, like, I'll give you a short story. Please. Yeah. We were going so fast. Um, like I would just turn a blind eye to this woman who employed me as a model. And, mm-hmm. um, I was just taking the money and run, but the way she was treating me as a human, I wouldn't allow my mom or my sister or one of my best girlfriends to treat me that way. And this, and I was saying this person was my friend, but Mm. also, you know, yeah, this person was my friend and I would give them all these like tips and things, excuse me for self healing and taking care of themselves. And I tried as an angel, I saw her as an angel and tried to like, quote unquote, save her and protect her and give her all these things. But she became like on these drugs, like prescription medications. And she was coupling that with alcohol and drinking and went away a couple times to like, you know, get over this thing. And it's a disease, a disease, it's a disease. And that was more than me. And I tried for years and I had to just remove myself from that situation because it was toxic. It was psychologically a toxic environment. And I needed to clear space and clear my white canvas, the energetic aura and canvas of my life 
to have a stronger top five because she was on my top five to remove her because I was allowing that lower vibration and, and lower choices to be mm -hmm. implemented into my life. And this is this, this is the takeaway from it, right? I would get booked on jobs. I, I dismantled this, this opportunity, which was one of my revenue streams of 30 to $60,000 per year from, from this woman's agency. And I had to dismantle that. And I knew I was going to take a hit and I wasn't going to have this money for the next year. It actually, it was about a year and a half. If I'm being, if I'm being real with you, yeah. but I knew by dismantling, instead of running around for 30 to 60 jobs per year, I knew if I dismantled and I showed up for myself and for my character and for the divine femininity of my life journey and my career and my world, I knew long-term I would show up to a job, one job and get mm -hmm. 30 to $60,000 instead of just running around at a lower level. So I took a time out and I knew it was going to, I didn't know. I said it was going to hold me back. Not that it needed to, because I could have then shifted and booked a job, you know, that paid that much. But instead of running around for peanuts, if mm -hmm. we're making better quality choices for ourselves and we're rising and making these better choices, mm -hmm. then instead of running around, right? Like, mm -hmm. like, like I was, I, I knew whatever you believe in, God, the universe, the source, all of it, me, I knew I would empower myself and rise and treat myself better. And then I'd be treating other people better. And I was doing a disservice by staying in communion with this person because I was enabling this behavior and I wasn't mm -hmm. helping her. I was feeding the beast. I was yeah. feeding the beast. And I was, lastly, I was make i you know you know i did i did it for a while and mm -hmm. i was conscious of this and i was aware of it but i love this person but i was scared because i thought they were gonna get mad at me and i was scared and I'm like i didn't want to lose this money because mm -hmm. i have a beautiful home in california and i didn't want to have money issues so i was you know staying in it because i didn't want to uh from fear i didn't want to, i was an excuse and from fear i didn't want to dismantle because i didn't want to lose out on what i was gaining from it so the, the, the point, another point is the holidays came around and things slowed down mm. like the pandemic. So when, yeah. the, so when the, when the holidays came and things slowed down, I was in solitude for eight days. And when I was in solitude for eight days, filling my soul with audiobooks and DJing and doing music and just a beautiful time to end the year, to go into the new year. When I was doing those things, because I didn't book out, because I stayed in California, because I didn't book out the next day after she called me drunk, huh. like she owned me and the way she was speaking to me, I wasn't moving very fast like I would in normal business because I, mm. it was such a sentimental time of year because I slowed down because I was taking that time for honoring myself. Mm -hmm. When she spoke to me, the way she spoke to me, I, I like literally, I want to say put my foot down, but I turned the phone off and right. I hung up on her and she called me back and I could have said my battery died. I could have just not picked up the phone like my phone died, but I didn't. I made the choice to pick up the phone and she's like, did you hang up on me? And I'm like, yeah, I did. And I, I'm like, you know, like, you're not going to speak to me that way. And that was my done with my communication with her. And I went on to work with the agency for like another six months, but then I eventually uh, terminated my contract and I dealt with the, the agents in the agency, but I, it was, I know what it's like. And I'm sharing this just so maybe the viewer and the listener can attune and align because I know what it's like to be stuck and not empower yourself to make that choice, feeling handicapped, feeling emotionally entangled. I've been there. And mm -hmm. that's the point of life for us to learn from no matter what the experience is, it's always an opportunity to learn. Right. Well, I mean, I think the biggest thing from that too is just self, it's self-interest, you know, it's self-interest within yourself to, to, you know, to understand and to grasp the thing, to grasp, I should say, sorry to know like I'm looking out for my best interest or my self interest with these. So yeah, it, it's very, very good insight, very good information. And I'm, and I'm sure it's going to be received well. And, and um, you know, I think people are going to have a lot more courage to speak, you know, to speak up after hearing that as well.
I hope so. Yeah. I really, really hope so. Doesn't matter how it looks or how it sounds because I get so stuck sometimes. I'm like, oh my God, but like, how is it going to look? How, what am I going to say? But the most important thing is just to say it, just to yeah. get it out. Like, even if you're journaling and you're journaling the same thing over and over, then you can go back and look to see what I'm, what, what am I, what is going on in my mm -hmm. head? Oh, circle. Oh, this keeps coming up. This keeps coming up. And then taking out one thing at a time. And when you take out one thing, replace it with something that serves you. Mm -hmm. For example, here's a short example. Okay. Here's a great example based off of everything we're talking about. Mm -hmm. Consciousness, our quote unquote time, our energy, mm -hmm. what we're listening to, what we're sharing, being mindful to put self first is more than okay. I mean, it's why we're here. Like we come into the world alone. We're going to leave alone, period. Like, like we are first. Right. And by putting ourselves first, we're putting ourselves in a better position and then putting, like I said, our, ourselves in a better position for others. So it's, you know, really good to do that. So the thing I wanted to share was here's, here's, here's a great thing to start doing. Okay. Let's say we look and we see who we talk to. Mm -hmm. And let's say we talk to this person for an hour and we're just listening every week we talk to this per one person for an hour or maybe for you it's 45 minutes or a half hour right and we're listening and it's like the same thing and they just they think they could just come in blah blah and mm -hmm. it's like people are just like blah like you know where are those boundaries where are those psychological energetic boundaries and we're sitting there and we're taking on all of this stuff and we're listening to it but where it's like one ear not the other we're thinking oh god would this person shut up would this person stop like just just i can't wait till this conversation's over so then be mindful you're creating and allowing these negative thoughts to eat at you and you're like making yourself do something that you don't want to do one two if you're talking to this person for an hour and that's that person for you mm -hmm. cut it to a half hour cut mm. it to 45 minutes cut it to a half hour shorten it shorten it shorten it and take back your time maybe you're talking to three people a week and let's say you cut each of them off a half hour that's a half hour more for that's an hour and a half more for you like oh just you know oh i gotta go to the bathroom i'll call you back or i'll mm -hmm. talk to you next week or I'll, let's talk later i gotta go to the bathroom. oh i just remembered i had to do something for work oh i have to watch something for something uh, right. You know, just just remove yourself from the situation. Same mm -hmm. thing that's on the phone. That same thing if you're in person or if you're at a party or an event and you're like, yo, what? this does not feel good. Be like, oh, my God. Like, I just I remembered like I have I have to do something before t tomorrow's work schedule or I have to. Oh, I don't know what's going on with my stomach, but I'm not feeling well. Just get mm. out of the situation, like okay. get out, remove oneself from the situation is the number one thing we can do. And to prepare these getaway, quote unquote, protective tools before we're in the eye of the storm. Because when you're in the eye of the storm, you don't want to start new things. Because like I said, our prefrontal cortex, our rational cortex shuts down and our you know nervous system takes over and we're emotional. So sometimes we get frozen and numb. I know I've gotten frozen and numb and I'm, I feel so stuck. I've sat in so many discomfortable, so, so much discomfort. I've sat in so much discomfort for such a long time, knowing it, that I'm so used to just being there, numb and paralyzed. Mm -hmm. It's the worst feeling mm -hmm. when you feel trapped mentally mm -hmm. and physically. And where did that come from? Like where did that develop, understanding that, computing that, being able to um, compartmentalize that, where did that come from? Because I, I, you know, I'm just trying to put myself in those shoes and, or in that situation. And if I go back to myself, maybe 10 years ago, I would have not been able to think like that, given my experiences and everything. So for you to be able to understand that, and to convey in the way that you do, how did that come about? Is this something that you were just naturally born with? Did you have to go through trials and tribulations to get all that? But where did that come from? All of it. It's all of it. And I mean, that's why I have an 11 X method and I've, I have clients that I coach. So, I mean, it's a lot, but I give people the tools, some of which we've been talking to about today, but so many more tools, for example, like Caroline Mice, M Y S S. She's a mystic intuitive. She has an amazing tech talk on choices. I write for Ariana Huffington, formerly on the Huffington post now on thrive global. And I was so moved about, about Caroline mice and what her practices is and her teachings that I wrote an article on thrive global about it, but she has like over 10 books that you can listen to on audio. And 
she has one called channeling grace and she it's her voice on all of them and it's just it's so healing and it's so therapeutic but there's overdrive which is an app you just put in your library card or you get one if you don't and you can download up to 30 audiobooks per month for free and if you prefer yeah if you prefer reading you can download up to 30 ebooks for free on the Kindle or your iPad and you check them out from Amazon because the library around the world has overdrive Mm -hmm. and like all this education. So you can, so I, you know, went on a journey of listening and reading all of these books and being involved with like neuroscientists, like Dr. Greg Braden, and just, you know, just being a seeker. You know, I always tell people I'm like Socrates' younger sister (laughs) and his definition of a philosopher is a person who's a lover, who's a seeker of wisdom. And I've always felt like I've been a seeker um, of the world. And so um, by understanding and by seeking and then also experiencing, because it's one thing to understand it from a psychological knowledge perspective because I read a book and I can read you the ABCs or hard facts of how many organs we have in our body. Mm -hmm. There's another experience that you mentioned earlier on about the stuff that we don't see, you know, and the, uh, the emotional aspect, you know, of hope and faith and dreams and, and identifying with the downloads and the gifts that come like clouds that Mm. come and go, but then that are right there. But people sometimes don't feel and see because we've been taught to be numb. So it really takes place with self and making a choice and doing one step at a time, doing a lot of journaling is mm. great. Yeah. I just finished a journal book at two, two thirty in the morning mm. and uh, I'm so happy and proud and excited. It's I do. It's called a joy journal. Mm. And I started doing a, a joy journal when I saw Ashley Stahl has a beautiful Ted talk and her book called U turn, how you can take a 180, a U turn with your life. Like, Oh, I've lost my mojo. All this stuff has happened, but how do I grab life by the the wheel and do a 180 to empower self, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, she mentioned a joy journal. So I started my journey on April 26th of a joy journal. And today's Mm. July 26th. So it was cool when I I looked at, you know, at 2.30 in the morning when I started it and when Mm -hmm. I ended it, it was literally like, uh, April, May, June, July. It was a four month cycle. And not only did I do a joy journal where I put joy, the date and the time, but two pages after I put bothersome. So I was doing my joys to be aware of my joys, which could be coffee or toes in the sand or a butterfly, just simple joys, like anything that brings you joy, like podcasting, having this Mm -hmm. conversation, like, you know, I'm smiling right now. Just those things bring me joy. But I was also on my own journey of starting something. So you, that's what I'm, I'm trying to share with you and the listener and the viewer of like, you just start by doing a choice and then you tailor it and mut- and like putty and you, you make it your own sculpture and design. So it doesn't have to be exactly like this or exactly like the book says or exactly like this human says. You take the good and what you like of it and then you just discard the rest and you keep on moving. You learn from these people who have come before us, like Mm -hmm. Plato, the Republic, you know, just and unjust. And I love his book. It's one of my very, very favorite books in the world and identifying and understanding just justice and what is unjust, right? Like we Mm -hmm. were talking about earlier. So uh, uh, when I did my joy journal, I then created the bothersome because sometimes I was so very upset and so frustrated that I didn't want to write my joys because I was so angry and mad. So I would allow space to let me get my bothersome out. So I would write down all these bothersomes. And then when I'm, you know, getting all rid of the, the toxic, crappy, bothersome stuff, all of a sudden it's so subtle. And if you want to feel that subtle shift of energy within self, right when you're really upset and then when you f- fill your cup of, get or empty your cup of all this crap and you're putting it on screen. There's this subtle shift of vibration where I naturally think of a joy, where I naturally Mm. think of something. And then I have to turn the page two pages over to then start writing down my joys Mm -hmm. and then, and then being able to write all my joys out. 
So I, I created that, you know, and it's something I do. It's something I teach my clients. Um, so I hope, you know, you get that, like it, vibe yeah. with it. No, yeah, that's it's my first time hearing that too. So it's an introduction uh, myself. To, I love that idea, the joy journal, because I think, um, you know, again, to go back to, you know, being conditioned a certain way, a lot of the times we just think of just jotting down, you're just, you're just writing something down or you're venting or your journal is just there as a book, you know, but to have that, the joy journal, it just, even, even hearing it itself seems more, you know, welcoming to, to, to do. So yeah. Oh, I yeah. like that. I Thank you. I have, a, um, and two things. One, someone's like, oh, I don't like writing. I don't have, I'm not good at writing. People don't like writing. The good thing about writing is it's when you write your, it connects the hand to mm -hmm. the heart. So that's the cool thing about writing instead of typing it out, but some might want to type it out. Some, maybe they're not, they, they don't have good penmanship or they're not good at writing or spelling. So don't worry about the spelling, just write. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's for you. It's not for anyone else. But you can take your phone and do an audio. You can you can just vent it out with audio if you want to yeah. have an audio diary. Um, that's one. Two, I have a voiceover diary for voiceover. I have one for my actor. I have one oh, for wow. podcasting. I have one for my artist where I don't write words, where I draw and I doodle. So sometimes mm. I express with symbols and by doodling and by writing um, you know, and that's a form of art in its own, whether you go in to take that to be anything in life or you just keep them for yourself, you know, you can yeah. take it. There's some, there's some traditions people have where it's like you write down on a piece of paper and then you go outside and you burn it. You, you write a letter to someone, but if you don't really want to ever give it to them, you can just write it and then you burn it. So some people do that on like the new moon or the full moon, there's mm -hmm. sacred contracts you know, um, there's something called sacred contracts. Um, there's, you know, full moon ceremonies. Yeah. There's the full moon. Um, there's also the new moon, which happens, you know, what, once a month, something where it's like that, yeah. the full cycle of the new moon where you, you know, like just yesterday, like today's opening a whole new portal. If you mm -hmm. look at the portal of Ascension mm -hmm. from July 25th to 26th, I can text and show it to you, but, um, you know, on the new moon, it's a place, if you look, read about it, it's a time to set new intentions, not based off your current circumstances or what you're obligated to, but based off of something new. Mm -hmm. I want to be living somewhere where there's more nature. I want to not be living with this person, like set the intention. Like I, I want to have more of this in my life, like set the intention. And when you set the intention, and that's why I like having a start date, but then being able to pivot that start date, because once you have the start date and you have the attention, you're telling and showing the universe by universal law, I'm showing up and I'm serious. And then the universe starts to work for you. It yeah. doesn't, we don't work for the universe. It works for mm -hmm. us. Yeah. Oh yeah. I mean, I love that. I love to hear that. Amazing. Um, there's two, there's two things, um, lastly that I want to, uh, to speak about. Um, well, for, actually, before we to, to uh, close out with a voiceover, I, I also want to say I think it's really cool that you have the voiceover roles as, as uh, in the cartoons. That's amazing. So I just want to tell you, you. that. <laughs> I'm so grateful. And mm -hmm. it's so beautiful because with everything I've done thus far in my life, I think it's really great because while I'll, I'll want to, God willing, start a family, it's mm -hmm. so awesome that I can still act and have so much fun and be a kid in a candy store mm -hmm. and start a family but then also record a series from being home and also as an on-screen actor still do mm -hmm. animation series while I'm still filming a movie. And then I could still like do music and go on tour and do musical stuff, but still raise a family and, um, and, and still do animation from like my hotel room or pop into a, a local studio, whichever state or country I'm in. And cause a lot of times when you do animation, you can do like two to three, uh, you know, episodes at a time based mm -hmm. on how much you're in the episode. So, uh, yeah, for me, number one is animation. It's, it's my love. I love it so much. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, um, one thing I wanted to like talk about, uh, please, please, please tell me more about this earlier in the year. Um, you published a poetry book, a lover's fair tale, 11 poems. Am I right? Yes. Yes. Please tell me more about this. Yeah, it's on Amazon. I, I even think it's at Barnes and Nobles now, but um, A Lover's Fairy Tale, uh, you can get on the Kindle or the paperback. But 
Um, I love fairy tales. I mm-hmm. love imagination. Um, I love um, fantasy. It's just, mm. it's so exciting to be able to dream and to fantasize. And later on, I learned the mind and the thoughts are a tool and a gateway. Mm. But before knowing that, I would allow my imagination and my mind um, to run wild and I travel the world. And while I was traveling the world, I would be in that space of nirvana and bliss that I was kind of sharing earlier effortlessly because I'm not in my everyday circumstances. And we're, when we're not caged in with our neurological patterns and, you know, of ever, the, the day to day of the repeat and the, the same old same O and you're traveling and you're in new places and seeing new things and meeting new people and trying mm-hmm. new foods. And, you know, you're do you're in the space of the unknown and the excitement. So I was able to take pieces from my travels then and put them into my book. And then it's, um, poetry and the art of language and communication with also they're coupled with 14 magical beautiful pieces that I did with this legendary photographer Robert Sturman and they look like paintings and he's an amazing artist but actually they're photographs that were done with the original Polaroid that Polaroid discontinued in 2001 and Mm. so then they shipped him a bunch of boxes of Polaroids and he put them in the freezer to preserve them and we did a series together I was his muse and we did this series and during the time that we did the series is also the time of when I went to some of these places. So I thought it was very apropos to use the symbolic meaning of the language and the, the words of, of what my vessel was going through with also the imagery of how I looked then and what I was expressing as an artist, as a model then. And so they go into the Book of Lovers fairy tale and um, I have merch. So it's like coffee and poetry. So a loversfairytale.com. Uh, You can get some uh, coffee mugs uh, with the images of me on them from the book. And then also if you go there and put in your email, I have an automation set up where along the way um, for over 10 years, I self-produced, self-financed, directed, and Mm -hmm. starred in the spoken word music videos. And I gift you a playlist um, when you put in your email at a loversfairytale.com or my website, chinakas.com, my last name. And um, it sends you this automation of a playlist that I curated for the 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 digital. So it's like multi-dimensional art with the poetry book. And what happened was during the pandemic, normally when it's my birthday, I'm like, where's somewhere in the world I haven't been that I want to go? Like a kid mm. in the candy store, right? Yeah. But with the pandemic, I wasn't traveling anywhere. So then I shifted my question and it's like, what's one thing that I've always wanted to do that I haven't done? And I'm like, since I was 12, I wanted to publish a poetry book, but there wasn't self po- po- there wasn't self publishing then. There wasn't Mm-mm. Amazon self publishing. Um, there wasn't, you know, so I decided to empower myself and my birthday gift to myself was to publish a poetry book on World Poetry Day, which also happens to be, ironically, my parents' uh, anniversary, March Mm -hmm. 21st. So it was really beautiful and sacred. So then what I did as an artist and for like a marketing perspective, independently, of course, Mm -hmm. I curated all of those spoken word music videos that I made along the way and packaged it with the book. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I mean, that's you talking about taking a leap and, and, and um, trying something to do something like you said to to anything that's independent. We already know right there. It's you know, it's to not have that backing to, and, and um, to do something like that. It's it's tough to do. It's uh, it's courageous and it's scary at the same time. Yeah, exactly. What everything you just said. And I didn't know how it was going to turn out like I didn't know I was going to curate a playlist on YouTube and that there was going to be a thing called YouTube. Yeah. I was writing these poetry pieces before there was a YouTube, but mm-hmm. it set me up. And but I was able to, I was able to make choices and go with the flow in life and make certain choices, and then take all of that and circle it around to the first published poetry book. And now, God willing, I'll be able to publish more books. You know, moving forward, which would be you know really beautiful. Um, you know, there's no guarantees and promises, but 
uh, I definitely, I mean, it's a whole nother podcast to talk about right. um, the hurdles and the mm. jumps of one of what one artist needs to do to be recognized as an author to get a book deal. I mean, that's that's one avenue, but just for your music to be heard, same thing and to be signed to a label and same thing for a painter or a photographer to be represented by an art gallery, like the whole networking of of all of that. I mean, times have changed. It's not like what it was. Mm -hmm. And now there's so much and there's so much digital art and there's so much self publishing and self representation that we actually don't need the brokers and the dealers like we used to. Some people are traditional and have that and those are in play and that's awesome. But then there's people who are the entrepreneurs who are not waiting on another person's approval and self doing it because I'm not waiting on anyone. No. When anytime I've waited on anyone to do anything, I mean, yeah. come on, like you can do it better yourself. Right. No. Yeah. And that's that go getter mentality. So I, I definitely understand where that's coming from and everything. And, and, and also it was, I don't know if it's this book, but first author NFT. Yes, yes, yes. So exactly. Yes. So that's so I, yeah. Mm, I love the space and the community of NFTs. Mm -hmm. I'm really excited about the NFT uh, platform and the opportunities. Kind of like what I said, not needing to wait for an art dealer or a label to um, represent me. I can put it out on the blockchain. And I really like Matic. It's um, M-A-T-I-C because mm -hmm. being conscious and aware of the environment where you can mine and, you know, in an environmental friendly way, put certain things on the blockchain um i've learned along the way and i'm still learning about this space but um when you put something um on the blockchain like a poetry piece or a piece of art or this podcast or anything it's really awesome because when you i haven't done auctions but if you just put it up there to sell it when you sell it like whoever buys it you can do unlockables and mm -hmm. then also you set the percent and standards kind of 10%, right? Just like it would be for an artist. Like right. as an actor, my agent gets 10%. Voiceover act agency gets 10%, like manager 10%. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I know music's a bit different. Sometimes they take 15, 20%. Yeah. But, uh, but, you know, being an uh, NFT artist, you put your stuff on the blockchain and let's say I sell it, I get the full amount of money plus 10%. Then let's say... I sell it to you and you keep it for three years and then you resell it for more money, right? Mm -hmm. Then that 10% initially will go to me and they can keep selling it 10, 20, 30 years from now. And every time it sells and resells, just like a broker deal with a gallery and the galleries get that 10% every time they sell their piece of art mm -hmm. for however much percent they get, you as the artist, as the original person who put the um, piece on the blockchain, gets that initial 10% or whatever percent you sell um, or set it to. So you're always um, getting that, which is a really cool thing about the blockchain. Yeah. I mean, that's really cool in itself and it's a win, you know, uh, for yourself. And yeah, I just, I just love that, that idea and the love that, that the fact that you did that and the book itself. So definitely everybody, please go check that out. Do yourselves a favor and favor and the artwork on it. I just, I mean, just the cover and everything looks great. Yeah, and I'm totally tooting my own horn right here because I am the very first uh, poet to put a love poem on the blockchain that's coupled with rare artwork that was done with Polaroid, a mm. Polaroid that was discontinued. So it's it's so rare, you know. The so first, you hear, and again, I gotta, yeah. again, I gotta give that the first, okay? <laughs> but um, wait, are you an NFT artist? Not yet, but it's 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 in it's in the works it's in the good works. okay well we can talk more about that but also okay. um and uh it's really because i from the beginning when you're like oh flowers flowers mm -hmm. um i know like in poetry open mics we're like yep, snap, yep. Snap, snap, snap snap but in the poet or at the poetry community in the nft community everyone who's connecting they always give people flowers mm -hmm. so i thought i thought you were uh hip oh, on it already yeah oh i'm but like i said i'm i'm getting there <laughs> we're still it's still very early in the game yeah. I feel like I'm so behind, but <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. But um, but lastly, I, I I definitely want to talk about just as true it is to the name that she's all over the place podcast. Mm. Okay, so 
internationally you've been you know internationally known you've been around in the scene and network and television since like 2005 you've gone to all these places throughout the world you you know you you um you're so versed and so well in these all these areas of entertainment and um so within all that did the podcast shortly happen after or was this something that you already knew that you were going to get into or how did the, uh did all this come about Okay, beautiful. So honestly, I wanted to start my podcast eight years ago. Right. I, I just didn't know how to get on the train tracks to do mm. it. And um, then I ended up um, going to New York and with my producing partner, I'm like, yo, this like YouTube money. I'm like, you know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? Like, yeah. I want to get on some of that YouTube money. Yes. And so, um, you know, we decided to, we, in one day we shot 12 episodes cause they were like short episodes, five to 12 minute short episodes. Cause oh, wow, yeah. attention spans are the size of a goldfish now, yeah. seven to nine seconds. So, um, we actually, um, did the YouTube and we did a, a bunch of videos and mm. then I took a stand up comedy class and the girl in my class, she had me and other stand up kids on her podcast and she like set up shop right there, like after class mm -hmm. with her mic with her laptop and just did it and i'm like yo like this is cool like i've been wanting to start my podcast and she was like a kind person uh you know a bit older than me uh isolda she has the innovative mindset podcast uh she's like oh i'll show you how to do it she's from russia she grew up in michigan she loved me. I loved her. She was just a, like a, an angel and a very kind person. She's like, oh, I'll show you how to do it. We literally just set the date. We met up for coffee on a rainy day. It was pouring mm -hmm. rain. And she was had a she had a gig she had to do. And uh, she had me meet her where it was convenient for her for coffee for an hour and a half before she had to go to her thing. And she literally put me on the platform she was on. And she's, I, I just, I sh um, stripped the audios from the videos from the YouTube. Mm -hmm. And because Katie's corner was all about my corner of the world and mm -hmm. my different perspectives on the things you mentioned at the beginning of the episode. And that's what I was doing to start the show. Like this is my oak tree and then mm -hmm. it having branches. So I ended up stripping the audio from those episodes and that's the first like maybe 10 x episodes of of my podcast of who am i and then me talking about like the 101 of modeling and music and acting for people who are interested in arts and entertainment and this was the oak tree that i just she's like oh when do you want to publish it i'm like right now <laughs> so we published it on like the 29th, October 29th, we published it. And that's what got me going um, and started on my podcast. That's amazing. Yeah. I, I like the, uh, like, like I said, the concept for everything in, in, on, on the uh, podcast. And I feel like j the amount of knowledge and, and expertise and, and being well-versed and everything, like I said, that you are. And I mean, I think it's going to be a lot of insight, a lot of opinions and a lot of just perspectives on lives that, um, you know, I feel like a lot of people can relate to and, and can correlate to as well. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. And it's cool because it's, you know, entertainment stuff, but mm -hmm. it's like you, you can only go to school so much for entertainment right. by going out and traveling and being of the world and seeing it and connecting. I mean, having the experience and just showing up and doing it mm -hmm. is, you know, a wealth of knowledge that school and a degree won't teach you. And I mean, right. Dr. John Janquish, he's partners with Tony Robbins, like the famous Tony Robbins, and he's a doctor and a scientist. And he was on my podcast and he was talking about like on the podcast, if you listen to it or put it in the show notes and listen to Dr. John Janquish, he was saying he much rather hire someone who doesn't have some $300,000 degree from someone who doesn't have this fancy title of a degree because they have their degree and they're not going to do the work, but someone who doesn't have the degree, they have that hustle mentality and that go getting mentality where they show up and they actually do the work. So he, yeah. he prefer that than over someone who is like what I just said. So, um, I thought that was really interesting. Um, mm -hmm. and because of, you know, being involved in health and, um, you know, mental health, so mm -hmm. when I was younger, like I ran cross country and in career decision-making class, there was a chalkboard of a hundred words. And out mm. of the hundred words, we had to pick 20. And out of the 20, we wrote them down, 
we had to prioritize them. And for me, number one was health. I'm like, if I have health first, I can have everything on this list and everything on the board. Yeah. But back then I was focused on cross country running and physical health. Mm -hmm. I wasn't aware of emotional intelligence, emotional health, mental, mental health. health. So then along the journey, I became this advocate and exploring those areas. So being in entertainment and the quality of choices and being female and putting up my shield and taking things on because I wanted to be seriously taken as a quote unquote businesswoman, um, now post me too. And then, yeah. you know, pre me too, before me too was a thing. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, having a voice for all of that and understanding it really correlates in the integration of she's all over the place because it's not only she's all over the place of the world and travel and culture and entertainment, but it's all over the place of what makes us us as humans and the quality of choices we're making for how we show up in the world for whatever our interests are. So understanding the different components of psychological, tech, physical, social networking, the different areas. Yeah. No, yeah. Exactly. Um, I, I really like, um, like can appreciate those type of things. And then, like you said, speaking about being an advocate for the health, mental health and physical health and, um, you know, kind of dissimulating those and essentially bringing them all together. So, yeah. Um, lastly, for the final thing that I want to talk about. Well, what, one what? second, one second, yes. because, because after checking out your podcast, it seems like you could be going in that reading your synopsis and stuff. Mm. I feel like you could be in that same family as well though. It's not just one thing when you hear the name, it's, it's, it's an integration of a multitude oh, of things. Yeah. I've layers, layers for mm -hmm. sure. There's, there's mm -hmm. a bunch of that. And um, yeah. yeah, you, you are correct on that one. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm, <laughs> I'm happy to be a part of your journey, to be on your journey and yeah. to watch you soar and to empower you and share your messages and what you're about as well. Yes. No, thank you. I appreciate that as well. And this is, again, all the more reason why I wanted to have this conversation with you and to have you on was because uh, of the communications that you've had, listening to your podcast, listen, listening to the sound bites or the clips that, that you've put out on other people's podcasts. Um, it's getting those and just being like, you know, again, I would love to have that conversation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, but lastly, um, bef before uh, getting, we're getting ready to wrap this up and, um, you know, before I can let you go, I am curious and I want to know. Um, it, it might be a difficult answer or a way to answer, I should say. Okay. What is, uh, what's, if someone, you know, listening or watching this or, you know, a stranger on the street would, were to come up and ask like, Hey, what's, what's the number one recommendation book for self-care or self-help? What would be the book that you recommend? Mm. I already know. Okay. And I mentioned it briefly earlier, really. The Four Agreements by Miguel. Okay. The Four Agreements and and understanding those agreements and showing up for self with those agreements. Um, you know, I mean, read the book to really vibe it. You can read it in two settings. It's such a short book. I've read it multiple times. Actually, I have it on PDF. I can send it to you if you want to read it. If you haven't yes, read please. it yet. Yeah, I'll send it to you. Just, um, I'll, just send me an email. I'll send it okay. to you. But uh, The Four Agreements and one of the agreements is well, you know, be impeccable with your word, right? Mm -hmm. And so everything that we're saying right now, everything we're sharing, you know, and what we're communicating is a responsibility of what we're sending out that the listener and the viewer is hearing and, and watching. It's, you know, it's it's because they're hearing it and it's going into their, you know, mind and their heart and their soul and their genetic codes. Um, and it's shape-shifting their beliefs and inspiring them. It's yeah. a responsibility what we do as podcasters, right? Yeah. Uh, as humans and what we share with one another. So being impeccable with your word. And another one that's my favorite is uh, um, do your best. You know, when you wake mm. up in the morning, I'm going to do my best today. Yeah. And throughout the day, if it's a hard day or if it's a good day, mostly if it's a hard day, I'm doing my best. I'm doing my best. At the end of the day, you let it all go. I'm letting it go. I did my best. I did my best. And you know what? If I didn't do my de best, I didn't do my best and I, uh, you know, I could, I could do better. And I, and tomorrow I'm going to try to do better. Right. So we can only show up and do our best, whatever your best is that day. And that's okay. Yeah. Whether you run a, a hundred miles or one mile, or you 
stay in your bed all day. You are doing your best. Like just be okay and give the permission to do our best and hold ourselves accountable when we're not doing our best and look at other people's best around us. And if they're falling short to what we want, select a new top five. <laughs> so you don't have to let them know and put it in their face because if they're already like Snoop says, right. In this interview with ASAP Rocky, I think in complex magazine. And he was talking about like, you know, like, he was always taking people with them, taking people with them, but then he giving them all these opportunities, but they would always be falling short. Like mm. if people want it, they need to go out and get it and make it for themselves. You can give them a million dollars. You can give them this money. You can give them the clothes, the opportunities. They're going to lose it all They're because they don't appreciate it. Like they need to show up for themselves and do it. So show up for yourself and like the people who are around you, if they're not where you want to be and if you want more, we don't need to rub it in their face and let them know. Just take note on it. You know, you know, because we can't take the finger and point it you 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 you're doing this you're doing it. it's a projection it's a blame because we're upset from where we are but take power back i i i i'm going to look at my top five look at the people around me i'm going to find someone who i can look up to i'm going to look to someone who's doing more than me not but what but what they're saying by what they're doing i'm going to watch right i want to mm-hmm. look at someone who's doing their best that's that 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 i equate that's my best I'd rather hang out with no one and be in solitude than be around people who are going to weigh me down. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Or and, be, or be the, uh, those, um, you know, I don't, I, I, I've talked about this about myself, but also I don't want to be in to put myself in an echo chamber, you know, the same people that's coming, I mean, that's going to not have um, different opinions or um, just reg- constantly regurgitating the same things you were saying, or just being a quote unquote, yes, man, you know, I don't want to be in that echo chamber. Yeah, I feel you. And I don't, I don't want to be the one who's always, quote unquote, right. Mm-hmm. Like, exactly. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. who cares about being right? My ego, righteousness? No, mm-hmm. let's get to the truth. Not my truth, not your truth, the truth. Let's get to the truth, you know? And yes. uplift. And, you know, by uplifting one another, we get to first uplift ourselves. And when we're, like I said earlier, when we're truly uplifted, then we can truly uplift other people. Yeah. But forget focusing on uplifting people right now if we can't even uplift ourselves. Yeah, no self care and self-help and definitely going to check out that book. And um, I appreciate yeah. that. Oh, you're going to love it. It's a yeah. great book. Yeah, for sure. Uh, okay. Um, that is all. That is all. Um, anything else you want uh, to let the people know, you can let them know where they can find you, check out the websites and um, how they can reach out to you if they want to. Yeah. I mean, is it going to be in the show notes below? Yes. I'll put everything down there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So definitely just uh, contact me, you know, be a part of my journey. Like I said, I do a uh, life coaching industry coaching, so I can gift you all this information so you can expand your wings and, and support you on your journey. That's what I'm all about. Perfect. And um, I'm so grateful Albert to be on your show and the, the questions and the conversation just has been just like really empowering and uplifting. So I'm so grateful and I would love to, you know, connect with you more yes. and keep our conversations going thank you yeah no and thank you for your time thank you for the amount of information and and just the uh you know the true conversations with this one i know that um sometimes i'm I'm not one to in all all my previous episodes i'm not one to exactly have you know a bulletin board of what i want to go over um and sometimes i just do things on the fly um but i try to give as much as as a good introduction as i can but these are the conversations that i just genuinely just like to have Mm-hmm. And that's you following your instinct and your flow. So it's so empowering for your viewer and your listener to, you know, trust in you that you do that. And then they look up to you. And so they can do that as well, you know, so, yeah. and there's something natural about it too, because it's real instead of yeah. like it being so rigid and scripted because, you know, that's boring. Yeah. You know how things can be overproduced, I would say. Huh. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, but Katie, again, thank you for your time. Um, I'm grateful and thankful that we were able to set this up. And again, looking forward to connecting in the future. Okay. Sounds good. Sounds good. All right, everybody. Oh, wait. Yeah. I mean, check out the sophisticated psychos. We're streaming everywhere. I make music with healing frequencies. There we go. So definitely attune to the music. If you want to see music videos, the sophisticated psychos, YouTube, but also definitely, uh, you know, SoundCloud everywhere. Our music, go check out the sophisticated psychos music. Yes. Check it out. All right, y'all. And there's clips too, actually, before I, before I uh, close it out too. Those are clips on her Instagram so you can get and you can hear sound bites of everything too. So please check that out. Okay. All right, everybody. This has been another episode of the Hypocritical AF Podcast. Again, I am your host, Albert Fig, joined by with Katie. So hope you guys enjoyed this one. Y'all stay safe. Peace. Peace. <laughs>
Thank you.